Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Whoop Podcast, where we are on a mission to unlock human performance. I'm your host, Will Ahmed, founder and CEO of Whoop. Got a good episode this week. It is Whoop VP of Performance Science, Kristen Holmes, being joined by Whoop Senior Sports Scientist, Chris Chapman. Chris is also the lead strength and conditioning coach of the Big Air Slope Style team for Freestyle Canada. The strength and conditioning expert is also a certified exercise physiologist and a high performance specialist through the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. Kristen and Chris discuss the key components to a strength training program. Chris shares some methods his pro athletes use that anyone can incorporate into their program. How Chris pays attention to HRV. HRV's role in strength training, the recovery tools Chris incorporates into his training programs, breath work, meditation, how he's worked in even the stress monitor, and how important being in the right mindset to train and perform can be for an athlete. Also an exciting time for those of you on Whoop because we just came out with Impacts. That's right. You can now get daily insights and information on how your behaviors and habits impact your recovery. You can find this feature by going into your Whoop app and selecting the coaching tab. You hit insights at the top and you will now see how all those things that you've been monitoring in your Whoop journal, behaviors, lifestyle decisions, you name it, affect your recovery. So it's a pretty exciting feature. Check that out. If you're new to Whoop, use the code WILL, W-I-L-L. When you're checking out, get a $60 credit on Whoop accessories. If you have a question you want to see answered on the podcast, email us, podcast.whoop.com. Call us, 508-443-4952. Here are Kristen Holmes and Chris Chapman. Chris Chapman is the lead strength and conditioning coach of the Big Air Slope Style team for Freestyle Canada and also a senior sports scientist here at Whoop. Chris is a strength and conditioning expert receiving certifications in sports science, exercise physiology, strength and conditioning, and holds a master's of science in biomechanics. Chris has worked in the strength and conditioning industry for 20 years, primarily with Canada's Olympic sport. Chris specializes in training acrobatic and endurance athletes, having coached athletes for seven Olympic games, both in the summer, canoe kayak, trampoline cycling, and winter sport, freestyle ski, ice hockey, and figure skating. Chris was instrumental in helping build Push, a Canadian sport technology company that was recently acquired by Whoop. And we'll say that um, as an aside, I'm around a lot of nerds on a daily basis. And Chris is at the very tip of that sphere. Um, That's a compliment, Chris. (laughs) Oh, I take it. I love nerding out. I know. I know. You're just one of the, I just love every chance I get to talk to you is like a joy for me. Um, So just really appreciate everything that you bring. To, to whoop and um, and just how you've you know leveled us up in just every way as it relates to all things sports science. So thank you for that. To kick off the pod, so our conversation today is going to focus on heart rate variability. Um, we'll refer to it as HRV, and how to think about it in the context of strength training. Uh, Chris would love to for you to start off with how you initially got into kind of HRV and how um, your application of the data has evolved over the years. Yeah, so HRV, um, I first got into it early on in the days at PUSH. Uh, I started consulting with PUSH in 2014. You know, velocity-based training was their, their big focus. Um, but they ended up getting a contract to work with the San Francisco 49ers. And this is when uh, Mark Uyama was the head of performance and Chip Kelly was the coach. And Chip had a vision of creating a monitoring system for all the players. And uh, the concept was every morning they go in for breakfast, they walk through the locker room, they step on a scale, they get their weight, uh, they do a subjective questionnaire, and they get their HRV. And we were using the iFleet system at the time, which was a wired finger sensor. This was before wearables were, were a thing. Um, and then they would check out again later in the day and you know, do things like compute how much uh, fluid they needed from weight changes. And it was kind of the, the first vision of a, a monitoring system. And that's kind of when I started going down the rabbit hole um, in, in what is HRV and why is it important? Because I had uh, I'd never really seen or heard of it before that. Um, so funny enough, it was the NFL that, that got me on that path. And then... Uh, Wait, what year was that? Spending some time dig- 
that was 2015, 2016, sometime around then. I don't know exactly. I came on to push full time in 2016 after the Rio Olympics. Uh, I was the head strength coach at the Canadian Sport Institute in Toronto. And uh, I kind of left my position there to just try something new. And, and uh, I wanted to go down the tech rabbit hole, just nerding out. I love tech. I grew up around it and wanted to change the industry of, of velocity-based training. Then that brings us to recent when we acquired Push um, and brought us in-house. And given that, uh, you know, I started using Whoop and I got a set on my current team, the big air slope style national team. And I've just been going down the rabbit hole ever since. Uh, I think it's the new form factor is the biggest game changer, the ability to, to have a 24 hour wearable. Uh, trying to do this stuff previously, like we even switched at push from the Ithlete sensor to the Elite HRV because it was wireless. But even just the friction of of the ultra short finger sensor collection, mm -hmm. compliance was was never a hundred percent. Yeah. And and now now that you can do it while you're sleeping, uh, it just takes away any of the compliance issues. I don't know. If, trying it with the the heart rate straps as well trying to get athletes yeah. to lie down or sit down and put that on every morning especially when you're not there putting it on them yeah it just was too much friction and yeah i know we exp I experienced that at princeton too you know the only time that we could take it um to fit within our basically two hours of allotted time that we had with the athletes was literally before practice so we had to do so much modeling to just you know be able to reliably take this kind of time point in this measurement and be able to kind of apply it to the training, not to mention it literally, I would get their HRV reading and it's, you know, literally five minutes before practice. So that I'd have to modify, try to modify things based on those data. It was just impractical on every level, but so, yeah, I can, I can totally relate to that. So, yeah, I mean, taking, you know, the, I think the whole concept, and I think what whoop has done is just brilliant. And I think a lot of other, you know, technologies have followed in terms of taking HRV when there are no confounding factors, you know, during that, you know, during slow sleep and, and really extracting kind of what, you know, what is your, your recovery status? And I, and I think it has emerged in the literature as being the most efficacious time point um, to really understand next day training readiness. If you want to kind of touch on just that as a, as a concept, it'd be great. Yeah. So prior to, to HRV, um, you know, we looked at subjective readiness using questionnaires uh mm -hmm. i've used the hooper mckinnon mostly but there's other ones yeah. like the, the perceived readiness mm -hmm. uh score or um you know there's a few others out really there that good. have been used but uh, both are really good yeah I think for, yeah they're, they're valid yeah and then using some kind of neuromuscular assessment mm -hmm. so for the for the most part it's been jumps uh it's easy to do there's lots of different tools you can do it um, you kind of create a normative baseline and you look at changes day to day. Mm -hmm. Are they jumping higher, jumping lower? What are some of the metrics underlying the jump? Mm -hmm. Is the jump slower? Are they taking more time to produce force? Um, or you look at a, a key performance indicator lift. So I worked with, with paddlers for a long time and we looked at a bench pull or a prone oh, row. Yeah. And you, you can pick, pick a weight or pick a speed and you just assess it every day and, and do things go up or down. And that kind of gives you an idea of readiness. Um, I think what HRV has done is brought a whole system stress readiness mm -hmm. score and it takes into account the things that are away from training, the non-contact hours, as I like to call them. You know, I can do the jumps when they show up for training. Uh, I can do the questionnaire before and after training, but then there's 20-ish hours right. to the rest of the day. What, what are they yeah. doing? Um, <laughs> All of those you, things are going to impact heart rate variability, right? I mean, that's the... That, yeah, that was my big insight too. When I was coaching, I was like, nothing I do to them in these two hour period, like really predicts their capacity tomorrow. Like it's just, all, it's just the confluence of everything over the course of a 24 hour period. But yeah, keep going. Yeah. And to give you an example in my athletes, um, one of them skateboards nonstop mm -hmm. when we're not on hill and he was getting way higher strain skateboarding than anything we were doing on hill. And so it's okay. You don't need any supplementary uh, cardio or energy systems training because you're getting all of that you're getting a lot of impact training too um, you know one of my colleagues with snowboard canada put imus on the skateboard uh, with his team and saw that skateboarding has higher impacts for the most part than ski training so okay he's getting his impacts he's getting his cardio 
it's taking care of a lot of the buckets of, of off-hill training for us. So just answering those questions, okay, we know he's doing this much skateboarding. That's taking care of all these things. So let's focus on something else. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a great vantage point um, or a great way of thinking about it. <laughs> I know that um, some of our NHL and MLB players on the platform were, you know, pretty uh, dismayed when they learned how much uh, a nine holes of golf was actually impacting their activity. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny, though, how you see just the like a skateboarding and golf and um, just even, you know, yard work, like how it kind of impacts that total kind of amount of strain that you're putting on on your body and, and influences your heart variability in, in profound ways. Maybe just what if, yeah, go ahead. If you have a point just on, on how to, to think about heart variability in the context of, of kind of rote ac- activity versus kind of what would be considered non-activity and kind of how that plays, play, how they play ball. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I, when I worked with the Ontario golf team, this was like 15 years ago, uh, that was, we had an aha moment. Uh, we were doing beep tests, like classic aerobic, and we found beep test scores correlated extremely highly with handicap scores. So the more fit you were, the, the better golf player you were. And so people think of golf as like a walking recreation. Maybe if you're karting, uh, it's different, but, you know, they make the juniors walk their bags. Um that it is an aerobic activity and it's going to affect everything you do. So I don't know. That was just what I was going to say. Yeah, on that nice. one. Cool. Uh, we've got a lot of golfers who listen to that. Group, so they'll appreciate that little tidbit. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I know in the Whoop podcast one at a seven, I just wanted to call this out. Um, you, you know, really went deep on how to create in optimal strength training programs. So we're going to kind of segue to HRV and strength training. Um, and I, and I don't want to retread on that podcast, but perhaps if we can just provide, you know, anyone who hasn't listened to that or, you know, kind of inspire folks to kind of maybe go back to that podcast as a precursor to this podcast or, or folks who just don't understand maybe what the components, um, of a strength training program really look like, um, you know, encourage them to go back. But Chris, if you just want to maybe just set the stage with a very brief outline of, you know, what, what are the components of a strength training program? Just how can people kind of think about it globally? And then we can kind of dig into, um, to heart variability and strength training. Yeah. I mean, there's two major components I like to look at. If, if someone, I have someone new in front of me that, that wants to do strength training. One, what is their why? Like, what is their goal? They must be sitting there for some reason. Um, and in my world and in sport world, there's a task demand. They have a task they're trying to achieve and they're trying to be the best in the world at that task or that task is paying their bills. So we call this demands capacity. What are the demands of the task that they're about to achieve? Um, and, and are those demands strength, power, speed, endurance, you know, general physiological qualities? Is there specific movement patterns? What is the times that they're moving? Like what energy systems do they need? Um, but specifically with strength, you can, you can get complicated, but there's, there's strength, how much force you can move. Um, do I need strength to complete this task? If I have higher strength, will this task be easier? There's a speed or power component. Um, do I need to move fast? If I move faster, will it make me better at this task? Um, if I can do more work, Will it make me better at this task? You know, your your timed racing sports, who can do the same amount of work in the least amount of time wins the race in most of those sports. Um, endurance, can I repeat that same task over and over and over? Whether that's a, a baseball pitch, or um, or uh, like holding a a, a windsurf boom. Um, you know, any any task where it's repeated over and over, opposed to shot put, where it's just I toss a, a heavy implement couple times and that's it Um, but then we look at the capacity of the human or the person in front of me and what are their capacities in those task demands and do they have enough capacity to achieve that task where are the gaps and let's fill in the gaps do the capacities meet the demands of the sport and usually when a capacity doesn't meet a demand it's an uh, area of opportunity for improvement or that's also a potential risk of injury um, because they don't have the capacity to do what they need to do. And this is a very biomechanics uh, approach to it. Um, There's a a sub-discipline called ergonomics, 
which is can we improve the human to meet the demands of the task or can we change the task so that it, it's optimized for the human and in sport we can't really change the task you know you can change some techniques so it's all about optimizing the human to meet the task demands uh, and i just love it because it's a very simple way to look at this whole thing now let's say we're not talking about athletes or or workers like firefighters people who have a task demand um, maybe it's just people who want to look better aesthetics or they want to be healthier uh, to live longer and and enjoy life or they want to improve their activities of daily living like an elderly person wants to have more function um, that, that last one you could say is a task but the other ones then it's just okay let's how do we optimize your your aesthetics or your health and that's almost a little little more simple um, because you're not trying to achieve some task it's more or less just focus on kind of component necessarily it's yeah which is yeah it's right, just more specific that, yeah it's straight fitness um you know it's it's nutrition becomes a, a much higher mm -hmm. focus for sure um but then it's it's about you know let's spend time in the gym whether it's burning calories or increasing muscle mm -hmm. mass so i'd say those are the the two simple ways that i would look mm -hmm. at it from a, a general person who's sitting in front of me and, and what are they trying to do what is the goal and then what is the task mm -hmm and what are the demands yeah. and let's create capacities to meet the mm -hmm. task or let's improve the capacities for the goals. Yeah, I love that. And I, I, I love thinking about it in terms of demands capacity. And I've done a lot of modeling around this myself and, you know, from a, not a biomechanic lens per se, but, um, but definitely from like understanding what are the physiological and psychological variables that are going to move around our internal status. Right. And we measure our internal status with HRV, you know, resting HRV with resting heart rate, some of these other subjective components, you know, kind of give us a sense of your internal status. Um, and then, you know, knowing, oh, then really understanding, okay, what can I generate appropriate arousal levels, mental, physical, emotion, emotionally, emotion to meet the demands of that task? You know, and this is, I think, a really, I think, important framework for people to think about, okay, what are the behaviors that are going to move around my internal status, right? Strength training is going to move around my internal status, you know, temporarily potentially in, you know, what we kind of perceive as a, a negative direction and that a suppression of HRV. Um, but over time, if we do it properly is going to raise our heart rate variability and raise our, um, our, our capacity really, you know, to meet future demands at, at a higher level. Right. So that's kind of what we're striving for. But I, I think this framework around adapt around um, demand capacity is really, really cool. I kind of, I call it demand uh, match and demand mismatch. And what I've seen, what I saw with my athletes over time is that, you know, the more demand match we have, um, you know, generally the happier, healthier, more productive that athlete is. The more demand mismatch we have um, in terms of, um, of this internal status, you know, and not being able to meet the demands, obviously the, the, the less happy, you know, the more injured um, and, and the less productive the athlete is. So I think that is, a, is an amazing framework to kind of, um, I think, segue into this conversation around HRV specifically and how we can think about that to increase these demand matches um, over time. We've said HRV a lot. Um, there might be some new listeners who just need a quick primer on what HRV is. So if you can maybe just um, provide a quick overview of variability and just why it's important, and then we'll dig into some of the strength training components. Yeah. Um, heart rate variability is uh, a measure of your beat to beat. So our heart beats and those beats happen in a time frame. And sometimes that time frame changes a lot, means there's a lot of variability between those beats, or sometimes it's the same time each time. Um, and it's a it's a reflection of your autonomic nervous system. Now I like I like to be simple. Uh, think coach but speak client is something a, a mentor taught me a long time ago. Yeah. And the, the autonomic nervous system controls the processes under the hood, the, you know, the things that you're not voluntarily thinking about. You don't think about controlling your heart rate. That's a, a response to what you're doing. Um, now there's, there's the fight or flight, which is the sympathetic system. And that is, as that increases, your body is primed to do tasks that are high stress. Um, you know, you, <laughs> It's, it's the response you get when you're in a stressful situation. 
like physical stress, mental stress. Um, and then the other side of it is rest and digest, and that's your parasympathetic uh, nervous system. And that is more recovery. And what, and what happens is your, your body directs blood flow to different organs and different systems based on which one you're in. Now, these two systems, you know, it's a balance between them. Your, your fight or flight can go up and go down, or your rest and digest can go up and go down. And it's usually an interplay between the two. Um, one of the things specific with weightlifting that's interesting is a lot of the original research was using what's called a spectral method. Um, it's not what the wearables use. They use a, a temporal method um, where the spectral method can look at both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and look at which one's driving the response. Um, and one of the, the caveats with a lot of things we're going to talk about is that this research hasn't been repeated um, using the newer methods. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, it's coming, and there's, there's actually a really good review that came out last year on this, but we still need a lot more research with resistance training and HRV. Um, so we're starting to see trends and we're starting to know things, but it's still not fully conclusive yet. I think the other thing with the research specifically around HRV and weightlifting is that a lot of it was done using chest straps and using ECG and using finger sensor uh, methods, not with the wearable methods. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't fully assume that all this transfers over to the very new school ways, mm -hmm. but that research will get there. I do think there's trends in the research that, that we can hang our hat mm -hmm. on. Um, and the recent review and meta-analysis from last year kind of solidifies that. They've, they've looked at all the research in this space and they, they can make some you know, conclusive statements based on what the research as a whole says. Yeah. So, so long story short, I, I think that may do justice. Yeah. Fight or flight, rest or digest. Yeah. The more rest or digest we are, the more we can recover, the more fight or flight we are, that might prove advantageous during our sport or our mm -hmm. activity. And would you say that, is it fair to say that your how responsive your heart is going to be to the demands of the autonomic nervous system um, that is, you know, its ability, you know, it's, it's, we're constantly kind of sending signals to the heart and the heart's responsiveness is kind of based on, um, your heart's responsiveness will be impacted by how you sleep, the food that you're putting in your body, your hydration levels. So all of these behaviors that are actually quite modifiable and controllable impact your heart's responsiveness to the demands of the autonomic nervous system. Is that fair to say? And is there anything you'd want to elaborate on there? I think so. I think everything we do, and that's why I, I like it as a general measure of, of overall stress on the body um, and what kind of mm. state we're in. Um, it's tough to micromanage all that stuff, specifically as a coach and, and someone who uses it on myself. Um, you know, you got to pick and choose the buckets you're going to focus on and, and the rocks you're mm. going to move. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big proponent of micromanaging because um, I just think it's just too minute and in the weeds and it doesn't flow with um, everyday life and, and just enjoyment mm -hmm. um, and you can get lost in the weeds. So I agree with you that all that stuff matters, mm -hmm. but I don't think we can focus on all of it at the same time. So find where the biggest gap is, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 demand mismatch, as you say, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and focus on that. Like maybe it is obviously, you know, we, we measure sleep. That's one of the first places I'll look right. is our, that's one of the best performance enhancing drugs we have totally. that is legal is, you know, stack sleep right. as much as you exactly. can. So yeah. let's, let's start with the, the big rocks first and move those. Right. I love that. I think it's such an important point. Like I, you know, and as a coach saying, you know, it's like you, you, it just gets overwhelming, right? When you're trying to do 60 different things at, at once. But I think, I think the approach and not just for athletes, but, you know, for anyone who has a body, you know, who's interested in improving their kind of longevity or in their health, it's okay. How do I actually apply my effort? Like, what are the things that are going to move around my ability to adapt to the environment in a functional way? And HRV is a measure of that, right? My ability to adapt to, to my environment is, is, you know, HRV is a great proxy to kind of help us understand how we're adapting. So understanding what are the levers that I can pull that will improve my ability to adapt in a functional way. And you meant sleep is obviously 
a huge lever, right? And stabilizing when you go to bed and when you wake up is a massive lever. Thinking about proximity of meals to, to, to when you intend to sleep is another big lever. Hydration, a huge lever. Minimizing alcohol, a huge lever. So if you just even did those four things, you'd be 0.001% of the population, right? In terms of getting it right and really kind of setting yourself up at a foundational level to be able to respond and adapt to, to your environment in a, in a functional way. So agree. I don't. I think it's really about, and if WHOOP is doing its job, it's helping people understand how to apply their effort so they can have more control over their ability to adapt to their environment. And, and this is where I think, you know, strength training is very, very interesting and a huge opportunity for folks to improve their adaptive capacity, right? Because it, it's, there's this beautiful kind of hormetic, you know, um, thing that's happening when you're lifting weights that really does, um, does is, is super helpful for, for again, anyone who has body, right? Um, so what would you, in terms of thinking about how, what can people res- expect when they begin strength training? Um, what can they expect to see in their HRV and how might they leverage that insight to modulate their, their strength training or to think more clearly about the impact that strength training is having on their, on their system? Yeah. So from an acute bout of resistance exercise, so you do a session, Mm -hmm. there is a response in HRV. HRV will drop for the most part. And then we can get into some of the details on what might make it Mm -hmm. drop and what might not. There's a lot of underlying physiology happening and, and I don't think I'm not probably not the best person to talk about that and don't need to go into the weeds, but, um, from what we've seen in the research, basically the number one factor in strength training that will create a drop in HRV is the volume of training. So how much strength training you're doing, that's your sets times your reps times your weight, Mm -hmm. classic volume load. Mm -hmm. So the higher the volume load is, the greater the effect will be on HRV. Um, And even when volume load is controlled, so there was one study where they they controlled the volume load and they did an upper body workout, they did a lower body workout, and they did a whole body Mm -hmm. workout. And what they showed is that the more muscle mass you use during a strength training workout, the greater the drop will be in HRV. And it's, it's proportional. Okay. So given that even when the volume is controlled, um, secondary to volume, uh, the intensity of the workout will cause a drop in HRV. Um, some studies have, have found there's no specific threshold. There was one study that found that once you go above 70% of your one repetition max, mm-hmm. so the most amount of weight you can do for one rep, and then take 70% of that. That seems to be the the threshold once you go over that we start to see uh, changes in HRV. Um, what, what you, and then the other one would be- What can we assume yeah. from that? Like, is there, you know, I always think about it in terms of, all right, what what is the, our gains that we might make once we kind of get above that threshold, do they come at the expense of health? You know, I, I kind of wonder, you know, we, we always think that, you know, um, you know, performance and health sometimes are orthogonal, right? Like, in, and I think that this is a really interesting question, right? As someone who, I mean, for me personally, like I'm not lifting, you know, it's, I'm not performing necessarily in the sense that I'm not trying to be, you know, make the Olympic the hockey team anymore. <laughs> like, that's not a goal of mine. I'm really just trying to like have a, a really high quality of life and, and be able to, you know, um, increase my longevity. So d- just wondering if, if you have it insight on, on just that, that fine point. Yeah. I mean, I think that training for longevity in life and training for performance, uh, they are two different things. And I do think that especially at high level sport where it's a career and it's, you're at the elite top end threshold, um, that it can do (laughs) to get to that level and to succeed at that level. There are some things that aren't beneficial for your yeah. health. Um, you're pushing the limits of the human body and it it will break at some point. You've got to try and find that threshold of how much can I do without it breaking. And, and that's where I think HRV is a valuable addition to the monitoring toolkit yeah. in that, okay, I can see that when HRV is dipping or, or my recovery is in the red, um, 
and it's depressed for long periods of time, okay, we're, we're overtraining. We're not just overreaching at this yeah. point, we're overtraining. Yeah. Um, and we need to be very careful mm -hmm. about that. Um, now, there's some interesting things here that, that um, have been shown in the research in that HRV does recover pretty quickly from a strength conditioning session, you know, typically within 24 hours, sometimes as quickly as 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we look at a neuromuscular marker, such as a jump or a key indicator lift, it could be up to two days, sometimes even longer, but it depends on, on how hard you're training. Mm -hmm. But the interesting point is that muscle soreness can persist far long beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, up to 72 hours, depending on the type of training you're doing. So even though we can be in a recovered state from our HRV, mm -hmm. Uh, and we can be in a recovered state from a neuromuscular performance standpoint, pain and muscle soreness can persist. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether that's perception or actual mechanical muscle damage, um, it's hard to know which it actually is, but understanding that you, you may be ready to perform from all other markers, uh, but you're still feeling pain and soreness, right. which you do have to take that into consideration and take uh, your feeling and perception of that, but you can also use it the other way around and that just because I'm sore, everything else looks good. So you know what, I'm going to perform today. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think one way to use HRV with training in general, but you can do this with strength training, you know, if I'm having an average day where I'm within my baseline, you know, just keep training as normal. If I'm, I'm higher than normal, like my body is highly recovered uh, it's, and it's ready to take on strain, um, I can push myself that, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's adding more volume or adding more intensity um, to try and create more stimulus, create more adaptation. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, the way that it tends to be used is more on the other side in that if my HRV is still depressed, when I'm about to go do my next session, uh, I can do one of two things. I can delay the session and maybe wait another day. Um, and there's a, there's a, a study that, that actually did that as they looked at, you know, just a regular scheduled training versus an HRV modulated training where if it wasn't back to baseline within 24 hours, they waited another mm -hmm. day. Um, but what they actually found was that the, the HRV training did the same amount of workouts yeah in two weeks less of time. It was five weeks versus seven weeks to get 20 sessions of training in. So using HRV, you could actually accumulate the same amount of volume and work in a much less period of time, which that shows us that just using a scheduled training session, mm -hmm. we're not maximizing our potential adaptations, mm -hmm. uh, that we can train harder than yeah. that. Which is so hard for practitioners who are trying to plan and have big teams and I totally can appreciate the challenges associated with individualizing plans based on HRV. But, but if we're actually looking to, you know, maximize individual potential, that really is the path. And just one question on that. And you said they looked at a three-day trend of HRV and, and not just an acute kind of daily HRV. I just want to make sure that that is clear because how I think about it, I look at my HRV CV over the course, you know, like I'm not really to then plan my week training as opposed to so I look at my individual variation day to day to understand how I'm adapting. So I don't necessarily look at acute HRV, nor did I, I do that for my athlete. So I guess I'm just wondering what, what is more useful is just, you know, is it, okay, I look at, Hey, what I did last week. And I look at my adaptation over the course of the last week, I look at my HRV CV and then, um, and then I plan m this week based on kind of how I adapted. Yeah, this study specifically, they, they computed a baseline and they used the smallest worthwhile change, okay. which is a way to compute, is this change actually meaningful or mm -hmm. not? And then they actually did look at the acute score and it was, if it's not back to the baseline within 24 hours, another day was taken rest before the strength training session was completed Okay, um, versus a, fi a fixed, fixed schedule of a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I don't remember the exact details, but we have the study. We'll put it in the, in the show notes after and, and this um, so, so people can dig in. But back to the, the point I was saying before, as I was continuing my train of thought here, I think yeah, the way okay. that I see it used and one of the ways I use it is when HRV is still depressed, 
how do we modify training so it's not as intense? And you have to remember in, in my world, um, I have athletes that are performing a high acrobatic skill with extreme risk of injury and potential death during the sport. So if they're not in a state where they can be fully focused on the task at hand, um, enter a flow state and do what they need to do, especially when they're learning new tricks, um, you know, things can go wrong real fast and, you know, at ACL and you're out for a year concussion and, yeah. or your, your whole career can end overnight yeah. if things go really bad. Um, so we have to look at not just the strength training in my world, but the endurance training, the other activities, the on snow. Um, so when you're, you're just looking at strength training in a silo, I think what you would do is if you see HRV depressed still, instead of taking another day off, I would modify the training. And what we know is that as far as volume goes, six exercises times three sets for each exercise seems to be the stimulus at which HRV will start diving. Mm. Um, and training not to failure is, is another factor. So when you train to failure, HRV uh, is, is much more affected. Mm. Um, you create much more fatigue in the system. And we've seen this in the, the velocity-based training data. You know, there's a group out of Spain, uh, Gon Gonzalez Badillo, Correa Blanco. Uh, there's a bunch of them there that they're big in the velocity-based training world, looking at auto-regulation, using speed to auto-regulate your training. So instead of prescribed reps, yep. you go until the speed yep. hits a certain threshold. You know, 20% velocity loss, we know that's where the metabolites, the ammonia, the lactate start building up and you start creating that residual fatigue mm -hmm. from a, a biochemical standpoint that's going to last to the next day. Um, whereas if you can keep it under that, then you'll be fine to train day in, day out and the recovery curve happens the same day for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so similar to HRV, what they showed, and it's the same protocol as the VBT, is that if you take an 8RM, so eight, the most amount of weight you can lift eight times. And instead of doing it eight times, training to failure, cut it in half, do four reps. If you're doing a six RM, the most weight you can do six times, cut it in half, do three reps. And that's a protocol used to optimize for power. Mm. Um, if you're doing, if you're training for a task and you want to train for power, but you don't want to create fatigue. So it's a general in-season protocol. If you have no measurement tools, cut your RM in half. Love that. Now, what they showed was that when you do that, there's no changes in HRV from a strength training session. So there's, there's things we can do that if we don't want to see a big drop in our HRV, um, keep sets three or less, um, do no more than six exercises per session and keep your rest greater than two minutes. And these are things that when you think of strength training, you know, three sets is kind of the go-to yeah. two minutes rest is that's about 94%. ATP, CP recovery, um, takes about seven minutes to get full recovery, but you know, we'll take 95 each time. Mm -hmm. So there's things that are inherently known in the strength training world that most people do naturally and most coaches prescribe. Um, and, and so just stick with that stuff. Uh, the, the other one that I would say was one of the biggest game changers in, in my strength coaching career was training not to failure. And I got into this through Dan John's book, Easy Strength. Mm. Uh, he's an American powerlifting coach. He wrote it, I think, with Pavel Satsulin, the uh, kettlebell uh, wizard, yeah. for lack of a better term. It for, and <laughs> it was, yeah. And it turned me onto this not to failure. So I started digging into the research. And again, a lot of it was from these, these Spanish researchers. And Basically, when you train not to failure, you see improvements week after week and you get recovered within the same day. When you, when you measure that key performance indicator lift two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours, within that same day, they're recovered. Yep. So even if you think about a weight session versus your sport training, mm -hmm. if you can separate them by six hours, not train to failure, you're going to be pretty recovered by the time you get on field or on snow for, for our kids. Yep. Um, and... The way that I would do this is use that same protocol I suggested, cut your RM in half, or if you want more intensity, um, leave two reps in the tank. 
That's the general yeah. rule of thumb, two reps in reserve that I've used. So if, when I was working with a limit, so if you rep, yeah, go if ahead. A reps for me, if I'm at like, oh, okay, this is my last one, I don't go to 10. I stop there. If I go to the next one, my technique is going to be compromised. Like I'm going to really, really feel it. Is that how people need to think about it when they're in the moment? Yes. And then take two reps off it. So instead of doing that eight, do six. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, that's so you're leaving, you're leaving two high quality reps that you could still compete. Table. So two in the top. Got it. I love that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And I like simple heuristics or general rules of thumb because not everyone has measurement tools. Same. Yeah. Um, so if we can keep things as simple as possible and the rules that athletes and people can remember, it just makes life easier for yeah. everyone. So I think, so what you're kind of saying for, for athletes and for individuals who aren't competing for a particular sport or discipline, um, consistency and availability to strength train trumps any gain you might make kind of lifting to failure. It, it, like with the caveat of depending on the goal. So there is a caveat, okay. here. the caveat being aesthetics. So people training for bodybuilding sure. or aesthetics. Right. Right. So training to failure has two main benefits. One is muscle size. Mm -hmm. um, if you train to failure, you're activating all your motor units. Um, there's some occlusion uh, type effects for hypertrophy, muscle growth you do need to train to failure. It is a great stimulus. Um, and the second thing training to failure is good for is mental fortitude. How much can you push yourself and fight through? Mm. And then you get a spotter and do drop sets or do negatives and do these things that push you beyond. Now, could these techniques be used in the off season for an athlete? 100%. And I've had situations where we need to put size on an athlete. But for the most part, if you, if you want performance, and you don't want size, which in my world, acrobats and endurance mm -hmm. athletes, most of them don't want to put on size. The easiest thing you can do, don't train to fit. Okay. So for the general exerciser who has life, who has a job, who enjoys going to the gym and wants to train more often, mm -hmm. probably for health and, and fitness, if you cannot train to failure, you're going to probably have more beneficial outcomes and feel better every day. With the caveat, if you want big muscles, mm -hmm. you're going to have to train to failure. Okay, cool. So, you know, intent, you kind of bring that up. I think it's really important. So if I'm in a, in looking just kind of in a maintenance phase, um, how do you think about, how do you think about novelty? Because I know, I know for me, like when I introduce a new kind of um, type of kettlebell movement or whatever, like my chances of getting sore are kind of a lot higher than if I doing something that my body is used to. So how does novelty impact HRV? And are there any, any data that, that around that? Not that I aware of, um, you know, in the research I've read, uh, haven't seen anything around a new exercise and how it affects it. That'd actually be a great little study. It would be interesting. In, uh, yeah. Is it, but you know, if we were to say, okay, novelty equals soreness, maybe just talk about soreness and HRV. Yeah. So, you know, uh, in season, I tend to only choose exercises that my athletes have done and are comfortable with. I try not to introduce new things because right. when we're in season, our goal is perform. Right. So we still want to make gains. Right. We're not, we're yeah. But we want to maintain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but given what we've seen in that soreness doesn't correlate with HRV, it's hard to know. You know, I would speculate you would still see a drop because of the nervous system effect mm -hmm. and the, the low frequency, you know, the spectral side having a, a, a change there. Um, so I would speculate that you would see a change from a new exercise versus continuing to do something you're comfortable with. But with the, the lack of correlation in the, the research that we've seen with pain and HRV, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because when we kind of get outside the uh, uh, kind of physiology world and look at, you know, the world of psychology and, and, you know, it's psychophysiology, but it's looking at it through the lens of pain as in, oh my God, my back hurts or pain as in I have post-traumatic stress disorder. There actually is a really strong relationship between pain and heart rate variability, suppression and heart rate variability and, and decrease in vagal tone and all that. So, but it's interesting I find it fascinating <laughs> that there, the, the muscle soreness, the pain that comes with muscle soreness, there's no correlation whatsoever. It like just, 
boggles my mind. And I, you know, and this was definitely at Princeton. This is why we, you know, we had obviously objective measures to kind of quantify readiness, but this is why I always like kept in the subjective measure because again, there were, you know, my ass is like, oh shit, you know, I'm like, my left ass is like so sore, you know, my left glute is really sore. Um, but it just didn't show up in any of our kind of objective markers. So asking people how they feel um, as a practitioner is very, very important, obviously, to get this fuller picture. Um, but, but where is, maybe talk real quick, kind of where the, um, where it's going in terms of being able to quantify neuromuscular kind of um, load and, and, and how that might actually, and, and how can we actually, you know, quantify that in a way where we can use it to modulate our volume and intensity more um, kind of uh, intentionally? Yeah, well, it's this process is very similar. So you have a baseline in in some explosive, high strength, high speed task. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I'll, I could use the ones I use jump. We use jumps with my skiers. Um, and once you've developed that baseline during a rest period, um, you you look at what is a real change versus natural variation. Mm -hmm. And then when you're testing, are they are they inhibited? Like, is there a decrease in that score? And if there is, you look at maybe pulling off some volume of training. I like pulling volume off before pulling intensity, but there would be times where you choose to pull intensity off. And, and given what we've seen in the HRV research, that volume has the biggest effect, you know, pulling that off would also create less full body stress. Yeah. Um, or if they're, they come in that day, and we've seen this, they can come in, they're not feeling great, they don't want to train, you know, they hop on the force plates or put on the accelerometer and they have one of their best jumps ever. And it's like, oh, I'm ready to go today. And it actually changes their mindset around, you know, let's get after Relief it. Effect. Let's do some extra sets. Mm -hmm. Let's try to, to maybe do a PR. Um, let's try and do something we've never done. Mm -hmm. Just let's push mm -hmm. it. Um, so I think you would use it the same way and almost like a different, um, you know, sp speedometer dial on your car. Yeah. You have your HRV here. And if both are depressed, that might be the sign it's a rest day or take time off, or let's look at focusing on recovery modalities. I would much rather find what they can do. What can we go to yoga? Can we do some breath work? Mm -hmm. Can we do something that's easy, that's going to promote rest and digest mm -hmm. and recovery instead of just saying, let's take the day off. Or if both dials are really dialed up, let's go after the heaviest squat you've ever done wow. or let's let's try and do something you've never done and really push it that's so cool what would you on the recovery side you know what would what are your kind of go-tos and i suspect that's probably very individual um because different athletes like different modalities and have different psychological effect um uh on them so but what what are just kind of you mentioned meditation and uh, what are just if you have a suite of kind of tools in your pocket as a coach that you use, which are the ones that you feel like are most efficacious at helping promote recovery after like big strength, big strength sessions. Yeah, this is where a lot of my interest is right now. Um, so one thing for listeners to understand is that uh, extreme sports, they have a high risk component and they're very outside the box compared to traditional sport. And when you add in the freestyle extreme sports, it's almost, they're almost like artists. You know, they, they don't live inside the box. They paint outside the lines. Um, they don't like being constrained. So there's a very free flowing, adaptive training that schedules don't really exist. And in, in an outdoor sport, we're at the whim of the weather. So it's, it's one of those things that you have to be extremely adaptable and extremely flexible with the training and, and that. Now, because they're very out there outside the box artists, I would say they're more into outside the box training mm -hmm. modalities and techniques. Um, I was surprised at how much buy-in we got with meditation and breath work. You know, breath work was one of the things I introduced. Um, started with box breathing and a couple other techniques we do before bed or before competition. Um, and then you introduced me to resonance frequency breathing and we kind of cycle between a few, um, you know, I've tried the, the sigh breathing, uh, from Huberman as well. Yeah. And I do find different athletes like different ones. Now, 
we haven't been able to measure what is the exact effect of that breathing. Uh, that's why I'm really excited for the the stress monitor Whoop just launched because yeah. we can have our athletes look at their their current score, yeah. which is made up of HRV and HR, right. and then we do the intervention and we can see how much did it actually acutely decrease. Yeah. So we can start to actually figure out which of those techniques is good for each athlete. Yeah, I love it. Um, and I th I think I would add the, the the caveat in there too back with HRV. Almost all the research with HRV shows that it's individual, that, you know, there aren't trends for, for sex or BMI or a lot of these things that you have to treat the person as an individual. Um, so with the team, we try to do that as much as possible, not only with HRV, but at the high level sport, they're ends of one. Yeah, so you have to treat them that way. And, um, you know, the, the beauty of a tool that's a 24 hour wearable, it's you know, treating them as an N of one day after day. Um, some of the other tools, I, I teach yoga. So we do yoga because uh, you can combine the breath work. I'll do like a yin style class where we hold a position for three minutes and focusing more on the breathing. Um, and I don't necessarily do the stretching for increased range of motion. Mm -hmm. If there's a deficit, if we go back to demands capacity, yeah. you know, if, if they don't have a capacity for say a certain type of grab while they're in the air, then we need to get that range. But a lot of it is about decreasing muscle tone and dr and getting parasympathetic drive. Mm. So we do do stretching and foam rolling and self massage and a lot of these things that, you know, you can find debates about them all, but I, I find that they get my athletes back into a recovery state and they're relaxed. And how can we create sympathetic drive as much as possible? In these extreme sports, they're driven into fight or flight. You know, you could die. So if you're doing a sport every day that you could die, obviously they're not pushing the limit that much every day. You're going to be shoved into fight or flight whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of the the work I'm doing and some of the research I want to go down is how can how much fight or flight do these extreme action sports get into, and then what are the best techniques to get them back into rest and digest. Mm -hmm. And this is the area that really interests me right now. Yeah, I think the same, you know, I think this is an area, you know, I work, as, as you know, a lot of my research is with the high stakes, high stress environments, you know, with military operators and, you know, who are in extreme um, environments and frontline health care clinicians and acute trauma surgeons and acute care trauma surgeons. So I, I definitely see this, you know, chronic activation, you know, chronic sympathetic activation in, in these folks. And and we are kind of testing all sorts of different types of modalities to to see, you know, and isolate the effect of these modalities to see which ones are really the most efficacious at kind of getting them, shifting them, you know, back into this more deactivated kind of rest and digest state. So I share that same um, passion and interest, you know, um, I think too, like knowing, you know, how to, what are these things that activate our nervous system you know, like a cold plunge, for example, you know, and I think you're, you make a really important point that there's a mindset element to that, that makes you feel kind of bulletproof and really accomplished, you know, training to failure sometimes is really good because you just feel like, shit, I did that, you know, and you're proud of yourself. Yeah. So I, I think there's understanding that, you know, there are really good forms of stress that can, can increase our adaptive capacity over time if we believe that those things are helping us, right? If I believe, if I'm doing an ice bath and I don't, and I don't believe it's helping me, then it's probably not going to help me actually. You know, I, I think there, there's these thing is belief effects that I think are really, really powerful and impact our, the cells in our body and our, you know, our physiology. So, um, so I, I think there is this, um, this concept that stress can be very good. And so I suppose, how do you think about that in your environment? You know, you like, you know, we're kind of in these environments where there's already inherently a lot of stress, but how do you layer on this kind of hermetic kind of stress um, on in, in, do we even need to, when people are already kind of chronically activated, how, how do we, how do we think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think your demograph, one of the, the crazy parts is that, you know, we're just playing games on my side. We're doing sport. Yeah. You know, it's, it's entertaining. Our, ours is Your demographs is life, <laughs> life and death. Yeah. yeah. Like, like you're dealing with real people and there's real consequences. Yeah. Um, I find that even more fascinating. You know, the, the colleagues I have that are strength coaches and performance directors in military yes. and, um, you know, that's, that's where the things need to go because they make a big difference. Yeah. 
Um, but to, to answer your question, so when we bring new athletes onto the team, and we usually bring a few every year, the goal right away is to show them how to train. And during our first camp, we get in the gym every day after skiing, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And it's to create the habit that you can show up here and do something mm. uh, instead of just going home and doing nothing. And if we're doing in a heavy camp, our general rule of thumb is keep your strength session and RPE six or less and leave the gym feeling better than when you showed up. That's awesome. And it takes all it takes is, is one camp to get this mindset adapted. And every athlete leaves that first camp mm. understanding, oh, I can train in the gym every day with skiing. Because most of the mindset is it's going to interfere with mm -hmm. whatever I'm doing, whether it's cycling or running, skiing. But you can do it. It's just about finding what's the right dose mm. and make it a recovery dose that makes yeah. me feel better. Yeah. And we, we see this in the data as well. You know, they show up and do a jump test and it's still good or the HRV is still good. You know, we're not just continually in the red. We're hovering yellow or even in the green. So. I think it's changing mindset and just finding the right dose response for the individual that is sustainable day in, day out. Mm -hmm. I love that. I And I definitely find that myself, you know, if I'm in a, in a scenario where I've got a red day, it's usually not because of anything that I did physically. It's usually, you know, a psychological thing going on, you know, where I, you know, not managing stress well or, you know, just you know, a tough conversation or, you know, whatever it might be, that's kind of, you know, it's caused some level of rumination. Anyway, I see that manifest in my heart rate variability pretty, uh, pretty much on, on cue, but I always find that like not going to the gym is probably the worst thing that I could do. Um, or, you know, I don't really go yeah. to a gym. I have my own gym here at home, but, um, but yeah. I find, but I think, you know, that doing something that is gonna, that's active, but that really feels good to me is important, you know, and, and maybe that's just going for like a long ruck, you know, with, a 30 pound plate and, you know, and I, I just, I don't have any real, um, kind of performance goal in that session. I'm just really trying to get outside of nature and do something that feels good to me that maybe doesn't feel that hard, you know, is it going to tax me? But, but I, I think you make a really important point that, um, you know, just lying around and not doing anything is, is probably not going to be helpful, um, to anyone. <laughs> um, so in, in terms of shifting our, our mindset and our mental state. So, I love that idea of just getting out and doing something um, and, and, you know, just thinking more intentionally about, about the, the, the dosage and, and what that activity actually is um, and making sure it aligns up. Yeah. So the athletes that come and, and they don't feel like doing a lift or they're, they're crushed that day, you know, they can hop on a bike and do an easy spin, uh, yeah. whether that's zone two, you know, it's all the rage right now, or, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, just something that is, easy zones mm -hmm. um, or they do a, a stretch while everyone else is lifting you know but you're showing up you're part of the team yeah. and you're still doing something that benefits some days we'll just say you know what let's go play spike ball or play beach volleyball let's go play a game where you get their mind off training and it's fun but they're still getting some jumps or some yeah. movement um, you know you, you got to mix it up every now and then and we we do a lot of cross training with other sports so we'll just try to to throw in tennis basketball uh, keep it low key, but just have fun, play a game, get your mind off it as well. And sometimes that that's all the stimulus they need. Yeah. All my coaches were uh, both collegiate and at the U.S. level were unbelievable in that regard. Like they really had a pulse on when we were like, we just couldn't get it. Just we could not go in the gym on the track or on the field. And they would just be like, all right, let's play water polo or, you know, do something something totally random. And we're like, oh, okay. Um, yeah. They take us whitewater rafting. Like they were just like so good at like recognizing that. And I think that's like such an important, you know, for coaches who are listening, you know, to just be in tune with your athletes, you know, and know when, you know, you can shift the morale by just getting them in a new environment, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with your sport like that, that always lifted our team up and we come back and train so much more effectively. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, and I would imagine if we were measuring it, we'd see positive, uh, influence on HRV for sure. <laughs> All right. So maybe just to, to recap, Chris, what are the main ways strength training influences heart rate variability? Yeah. So when you do a strength training session, uh, your heart rate variability will decrease. The more volume you do, there's a dose response. The more intensity you do, there's a dose response. The less rest you do, there's a dose response. So if you want to train and 
maintain, so not have a decrease in your HRV, not have overload stress on your system. You know, do six exercises or less, do three sets or less, have two minutes rest or more, and don't train to failure. Those would be the the general guidelines that if you want to train day in, day out, and not create extra stress um, and go into overtraining or overreaching, that that is sustainable day in, day out. Perfect. Well, this has been such a fun conversation. Um, I, I love that we we're able to dig into this. Um, I maybe one final question that I feel like we didn't we didn't hit on. Um, maybe just talk through age and how that influences heart rate variability and what someone might expect um, when they begin a strength training program. Or um, you know, is, is there anything there that is worth mentioning? Yeah. So looking in the science, um, in the literature, there's a couple of trends. So typically young people have healthy autonomic nervous systems and we tend to see less, uh, effects of a strength training session, uh, in younger people. So the more older someone is, the more chance they have a dysfunction of some kind or some kind of disease state. Um, and we tend to see greater improvement in HRV with those people. So if you do a strength training session and you're young, you may see no acute effect, or it may be back to normal within 30 minutes. Um, and that's okay. Uh, that's just a sign that you're, you're recovering good and your, your system's running okay. Um, it's when you get into to older people and disease pops where you tend to see more of an effect. Now, even through all of this, um, the literature shows that resistance training tends to not make long-term changes in HRV. So if your goal of training is to improve HRV over the long term, resistance training is probably not your best tool. Mm. You know, there's, there's a lot more research around aerobic training yep. and aerobic training for that energy systems training. So just a little caveat there. Um, but for the most part, there isn't a huge effect for age. And there isn't a huge effect for sex or BMI or any of the other physical body factors with respect to HRV differences. Cool. Thank after you. a bout of resistance training. Excellent. Uh, Chris, where can folks follow your your work? Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm working with Woo, so you yeah. can find me there. Uh, I work with the Freestyle Ski Canada. Um, you can find us online and then my own, uh, chappy strength on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I don't tend not to use social too much these days. I'm, I'm too busy in the trenches, kind of head down and not head up, but, uh, I always love talking shop, uh, as you and I know. So yeah. <laughs> if anyone's interested or wants to know more, I'm, I'm always happy to, to connect. Well, we appreciate you so much, Chris, and all the good work that you're, you're bringing to whoop and. We've got some really special features rolling out soon that I think folks uh, to our general, you know, general membership, I think folks are going to really love um, specifically around strength training. So, uh, so thank you for all your contributions and for your insight today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Big thank you to Chris Chapman for joining the show and sharing his insight on strength training and the impact on HRV. If you enjoyed the episode of the Whoop Podcast, please leave a rating or review. Please subscribe to the Whoop Podcast. Check us out on social at Whoop at Will Ahmed. If you have a question you want to see answered on the podcast, email us, podcast at whoop.com. Call us, 508-443-4952. New members can use the code Will. Get a $60 credit on Whoop Accessories. That's W-I-L-L. That's a wrap for this week. Thank you all for listening. We've got a very special episode next week as we announce a huge new feature. So look out for that. As always, stay healthy and stay in the green.